Anyway, thanks for having me. The Tip of the Mint Watershed Council is uh, just celebrating our 40th anniversary. And we were formed by a group of researchers and professors at the University of Michigan Biological Station, which is on Douglas Lake in northern Michigan. And those researchers were doing water quality monitoring. If you look at a map of Michigan, the tip of the mint, you'll see this string of incredible inland lakes that are all glacial formed lakes. They have very similar water quality histories and glacial histories. And the biological station is situated on one of those lakes right in the center of Sheboygan County. So those researchers were traveling around and they were um, doing water quality monitoring and outreach to residents. This was in the 70s. And they had federal dollars to do that. Then when those federal dollars ran out, they decided that they wanted to continue that kind of work and they formed Tip of the Bit Watershed Council as a science-based organization working to protect Northern Michigan's water resources. We also do quite a bit of policy and advocacy work. Our program has changed over the course of that 40 years, but we still have that significant tie back to it being scientific. We do water quality monitoring and research ourselves on the inland lakes, but we also partner with others to do that. But we do quite a bit of advocacy and policy work on the local level, the state level, and the federal level. So you will see my staff in Washington, D.C. You'll see them in Lansing and all across our service area trying to further improve protections for water resources on a policy level. So we're a bit schizophrenic. A lot of environmental organizations do kind of one or the other. They're either doing the science or they're doing the policy. And we've always, for our 40 year history, done both. Our service area is in the inland lakes in Northern Michigan, but we do quite a bit related to Great Lakes, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those in a little bit. We have um, a staff of 12. I'm the executive director and the staff attorney, and I've been there for 35 years. And coming upon my retirement pretty soon, I'm trying to get this, you know, what's happened with a lot of the early nonprofits that were all formed in the 1970s is those of us who are the founders are retiring, and a whole new generation of folks are coming into this kind of work, and it's really, I find it exciting to see. I love it when somebody, you know, my kids' age, ages are leading these organizations. So that's, that's really what's happening at the Watershed Council this, uh, currently. I did put on your table, and it was already mentioned, one of our general brochures. So you can read about who we are and what we do. There are organizations similar to this around the Great Lakes, um, but because of our unique origins at the Biological Station, um, organizations are a bit different. But anyway, take this if you'd like. You don't have to take any of the paper I put on the table. Oh, the battery's coming and going. Here we go. You don't have to take any of the paper I put on the table. That's for you to look at. If you want it, take it. If not, just leave it. We'll pick it up later. But So this is one of the pieces of paper I put out there. It's our general organizational brochure. And then the other thing, I did mention our 40th. This piece here is really um, a fun little timeline of the kind of activities and work that we've done over 40 years. And this is truly just a fraction of it. But you can take this with you if you'd like to see the kind of things we've been doing. And also, um, when you go back home, you can try to see if there's an organization doing something like that where you're at. All right. So when I first talked to Laura, she said, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And she said, what we wish voters would pay attention to. Well, there's a lot of things voters should pay attention to, not the least of which, of course, is the water quality and the waters that you're voting through. So, but I thought I would stick to some of those voting issues, specifically um, clean voting. But I do have some other topics that you might be interested in, and I'm happy to answer questions as well on water quality topics that might strike you. But we'll start with voting, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some other policy things that impact you, and then we can talk about some of the other issues like oil and gas and ballast water and some of those other things that um, in your other lives as non-voters you might have an interest in. All right, so let's start. Michigan has a new law, and in your bag, your packet that you got yesterday, or do they have those already? You had um, this little thing called the voter bundle, and it's a piece that the Watershed Council has been passing out for a number of years to voters. It has not only um, this new voting law, which I'll mention in a second, it also has a brochure on clean voting, um, which is here, and a little bilge pad for, you know, just as a, a 
tool to encourage voters to just wipe up any spills as you're fueling, etc. Obviously, it's a very small bill. Yeah, this is not for a big spill. But it's a fun thing for voters to see and package together with the informational materials. So those are in your packet. But the pieces in the packet I wanted to mention is the new voting law in Michigan, 2019. Michigan is the only Great Lakes state that has this law, but these laws are going to start to become more prevalent for voters across the country. It just did, I just canoed the Smith River in Montana, learned how to fly fish, finally. And you drive into the state of Montana and you have to have your boat inspected. And if your boat is carrying any kind of invasive from any other place, where you're coming from, you clean it before you enter the state. Which I thought was remarkable. Um, Michigan obviously doesn't do that. None of the other Great Lakes states do that. But Michigan now does have a new law. And I don't know if you had a chance to read this, but basically, you cannot launch or transport watercraft or trailers unless they're free of aquatic organisms. So that means you get the plants off before you move your boat. You can't transport watercraft without removing all drain plugs and draining all water from bilges, ballast tanks, and live wells. And you can't release unused bait into the water. You will get a ticket if you do these things, and a conservation officer or a marine sheriff or a regular sheriff sees you doing it. So at boat launches now in Michigan, there's quite an outreach effort with conservation officers and others standing there watching you inspect your boat before you move it in and out of these inland lakes. It's intended to prevent the spread of invasive plants and animals, which has been a huge, had a huge impact on our inland lakes, but also the Great Lakes. <coughs> Some of these invasive species will come in at one end of our Great Lakes basin, and you can just watch it and track it moving across the basin through things like bilge water and transporting boats in and out of inland lakes. So this law in Michigan is intended to prevent that from happening, and I'm sure most of you aren't putting your boats on trailers. <laughs> They're a little big for that. But you may have smaller boats that you do trailer around in other places, and this information in Michigan is kind of on the cutting edge of trying to prevent the spread of invasives. So I thought I'd point that out. The other thing then about clean boating practices, and we've been working on this. Um, actually, Ward Wallstrom from Wallstrom Marine first approached us about cleaning materials for boats. And he, had, he has this cute little conference room up top um, at the old Wallstrom showroom, and he had all these cleaning products lined up for me to look at. And he said, these are the things we should all be using on our boats. Those things over there we should not. And he was leading the charge, even then, on clean boating quite a few years ago, and became what Michigan calls a clean marina. He was the first up here in northern Michigan, and they had to meet certain standards related to their stormwater and cleaning products to be a clean marina. Irish Boat Shop followed soon thereafter, the City Marina followed, Petoskey Marina, and Bay Harbor. So every single public marina on Little Traverse Bay here in northern Michigan is considered a clean marina. That means they're following certain standards for their practices in their marina. So we started thinking about that too. What can we do to take information to boaters about cleaning products, about um, maintenance practices, about trash, plastics, recycling? And we prepared this brochure, and it's also in your boater bundle. It also has the same information on invasive species because a lot of this really is trying to protect the resources from further um, changes from invasive species. But boat maintenance, bilge water, fueling practices, what you're cleaning your boat with, these all have, keep getting positive impacts um, by doing certain things and certain practices. So I'm not gonna go over them, but please read this over and see you know, if any of this strikes you and that you'd be interested in trying these things as a boater, if you may already do all of that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about invasive specifically. On your table, you have these fungal cars, which I can't hold the mic and open at the same time. Um, these are for boaters to take on your boat, but they're primarily relevant here in Northern Michigan, aided to identifying and then helping us monitor where invasive things are, where the invasive plants and animals are. And this is something if you have, like I said, from wherever you've voted from, you can take that back and show folks this is the kind of thing that outreach to voters may result in some positive changes in terms of trying to prevent the spread of invasive species. So why are invasive species a problem? I mean, you all are on water, you see the changes, you know that sometimes it appears that the invasives 
are doing the good thing. So when, in, when zebra mussels and quagga mussels first, first hit the Great Lakes through ballast water in the 80s, the late 1980s, they started to, quote, clean the water. So they are filter feeders. They filter an incredible amount of water a day. And they're taking out all the algae in the bottom of the food chain. So what ends up happening over time, of course, is then there's no food for the little bit bigger of the bigger species, and then there's no food for the little fish, and then there's no food for the big fish, and then the salmon crash. And then we all start to say, oh, what's going on in the Great Lakes? It looks cleaner, but we're, then we start to see the top of the food chain falling out. The industry for salmon fishing, both commercial as well as recreational, then disappears, and we start to see economic impacts. What ends up happening, and we're seeing it right now, is those populations eventually eat themselves out of house and home. You won't find zebra mussels anymore on the Great Lakes. They're all gone because there's nothing left for them to eat. They've eaten it all. Quagga mussels, we call them their evil cousin. Quagga mussels actually came in around the same time as the zebra mussels, but they are hitting their peak now. And part of it is because they can be in colder water, deeper water, and they don't need a hard substrate to attach to. They can attach to sand or each other, which is always interesting to see. So now if you go out in the Great Lakes, and there are many, many organizations doing research on the impacts of zebra and quagga mussels, and they take down these sleds to pull up all of what they see down there, it is, there are hundreds of square miles of plain sand bottom land completely covered in quagga mussels. I mean, it's remarkable if you Google those images from NOAA and some of the other organizations to see what it looks like in the bottom of Lake Michigan. All quagga mussels. So we're seeing now the impacts from quagga mussels, and we're trying to keep them out of our inland lakes pretty unsuccessfully. So one of the things that we look to, and this is sort of the long-term hopeful vision, is that they also will eat themselves out of house and home and the lakes will start to balance themselves again. We'll start to see the bottom of the food chain come back and we'll start to see the resurrection of some of the commercial fishing. What's been interesting, um, knowing, talking to some of the charter fishermen here in Harbor Springs, is while the salmon, you don't catch salmon very much when you go out in the Great Lakes anymore, you will catch lake trout. And that's because the lake trout are eating one of the invasive fish, the goby. So we've got all of these weird ecological changes that happen from invasive species, some of which, you know, if you like lake trout, which I like, um, and they taste really good when they're eating the goby, they're actually less fishy than they used to be, we'll find charter fishermen actually pleased with some of the changes that they're seeing. So it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, we're finding the gobies might eat the quagga mussels, and the lake trout eat the gobies, and then we get to eat the lake trout. But long term, these are huge, huge shifts in the ecologies of these Great Lakes. And it comes from a single boat plying the, group, the international waters and not cleaning their ballast water before they come to the Great Lakes, dump it, and out comes all these little creatures. So ballast water is one of the policy connections I, want to make, I wanted to make for you related to invasive species. So the state of Michigan, completely surrounded by Great Lakes, has ballast water legislation, regulations that require boats to do certain things when they come into our waters. The federal government has similar but less stringent rules about boats coming internationally into our waters. Last December in Michigan, the legislature passed a law that said, Michigan cannot have any regulations that are stricter than the federal government's. It's called no stricter than federal. And a lot of states are doing this. It's, um, it's an effort really to sort of dumb down the regulatory processes that protect resources to sort of the least common denominator or federal standard. So now Michigan cannot implement its ballast water regulations. They have to do just to the level of the federal government. And there are people here in the state that are concerned about another zebra mussel or quagga mussel or something like that that would come in with these less stringent ballast water regulations that Michigan now has. So one of the things that I wanted to mention is at one point I asked my staff, I said, well, how many more things are in the Black Sea that are going to come for crying out loud? And there's a lot. <laughs> so this is, you know, as we merge these global systems together, 
we will find the Great Lakes looking a whole lot different decade after decade after decade. There are a couple books if you have an interest in sort of the ecological history of the Great Lakes or the geological history of the Great Lakes. It's really a great fascinating read. And one of the things that, um, one book from many, many years ago that I really enjoyed at the time was called The Late Great Lakes. And it starts from the fur bearers all the way through zebra and hog mussels and looks at all the really remarkable, significant ecological changes that have happened in the Great Lakes over those decades. It's really a fascinating read. And you can see these cycles of up and down and up and down. So once again, this sort of hopeful optimist in me sees that we will get back to some sort of equilibrium, but it will never be the same. There's no way that these Great Lakes are going to be like the systems that were in place before the fur bearers, the French fur bearers of you know, the 1800s. So that's the connection I wanted to make for you between sort of watching what's happening scientifically, looking at changing behaviors related to individuals and, and um, voting practices, and then policy. What do we do on the state and federal level to prevent this from happening again? And then also, you know, I'm, this uh, new voting law. I mean, this is an interesting thing that this would happen in Michigan right now. It's kind of surprising based on the seeming lack of interest on our state legislators' part in really doing anything progressive related to water resources. I was sort of surprised to see this actually pass, and we'll see what kind of impact it has long term. All right, so I did mention the no stricter than federal. The, the ballast water legislation, um, you know, we'll see what ends up happening. Maybe it will improve on the federal level, we'll see. So then the other monster invasive that, of course, the Great Lakes is looking to keep out is Asian carp. And I'm sure all of you have seen the pictures of the you know, six-foot Asian, silver Asian carp winding its way up the Mississippi Basin, leaping out of boats and knocking people out, etc. Anyway, that's all very true. <laughs> and uh, Michigan has been working in coalition with the other Great Lakes governors to push really hard for the Army Corps of Engineers to do something significant to keep the Asian carp from entering the Great Lakes through the Chicago River. And for those of you who don't know the, this history of the Great Lakes, the Chicago River um, used to flow into Lake Michigan. And then because of very significant wastewater issues in the city many, 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 many moons ago, they diverted it to go the other way so that Chicago's wastewater went downstream to the Mississippi rather than into the harbor where they're all living. So what ended up happening then is we separated those systems in a very weird way. So that diversion started going south, and then they built quite a large and very significant canal to connect the Great Lakes to the Mississippi. It was never connected before. They're two completely different systems. The Mississippi did not drain to the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes did not drain to the Mississippi. And it does now. So now we are facing an interchange of invasive species, not just from ballast water, not just from you know, people bringing cobras from wherever, and pythons in Florida. We're now seeing a connection between the invasives that end up in the Mississippi and the Great Lakes. And one of those is Asian carp. And they were brought in in the south to clean agricultural water ponds. So you know those ponds fill up with algae, and they become pretty useless to the farmers. So they brought in Asian carp to clean the algae. And then when it would flood, surprise, we all know the Mississippi floods, Asian carp would swim out of the ponds into the river. And they loved it. And they have thrived and moved north from when they were first introduced, all the way basically knocking on the door. Um, <coughs> there are several species. Some are bigger than others. Some are more um, prolific than others. But they are, they will, um, find a niche here in the river systems in the Great Lakes. Will we see them swimming around out in the big deep water? I don't know. But will we see them in some of the river systems that are a little similar to the northern Mississippi? Probably. Those will have, who knows, what kind of impact. I mean, that's the problem with these invasive issues. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know it's going to change things. And it's hard to say, um, you know, how badly that will change things. So Asian carp is something that the Watershed Council is paying very close attention to. We sit in on meetings with the Army Corps. We work with our senators and our congresspeople to try to get some significant movement and money put into that issue. What we'd like to see is re-separate those bases, which there's a lot of opposition to that idea, but it's put out there. Just cut that canal. 
you know, shipping that needs to happen from Chicago to the Mississippi, we'll have to find a different way to do it. So there's that out there, and that's a huge policy thing, but based in the science of what we anticipate may happen here in the Great Lakes. All right, so water levels, they're up, surprise, surprise. Um, and we do see impacts from high water related primarily to erosion, um, and then also some other issues uh, you know, related to water quality. But typically, it's an erosion issue, and then when the water levels are low, it's an access issue. There are organizations in the state and in the Great Lakes trying to have some controls, some specific controls on Great Lakes water level. That's a real difficult thing, and the Watershed Council's position is the lakes are going to do this. A lot of them are inland lake related or crawfish and weird plants and this thing called bloody shrimp that takes a bite out of its prey and then leaves it to die. I mean, these things are morbid. Um, there are no controls for a lot of those. So we just try to make sure we're watching where it's going and stop it in its tracks. And this is just the aquatic stuff. I mean, for those of you who are forestry fans, and you look at the forests and how they've changed up here. We have emerald ash borer that's killed all the ash trees. We have beach blight that's now taken, you know, a lot of beach trees out of commission at this point, killed them off. We have things that are starting to kill the hemlock. We had, you know, from days of yore, similar with American elm. We're doing the same thing species by species in our forests as well. Those, the Fish and Wildlife, not Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service and others have really tried to contain by not having you move your firewood and, you know, trying to control those bugs in place. But that one's also quite challenging, the online stuff. Yeah? Uh, do you have concerns about the introduction of foreign uh, species as a control measure? And do you have plans in place when they do end up going viral? Yeah, the, so you know, that used to be we would introduce one thing to fix one thing and that second thing then becomes even more of a problem. People are onto that and are really, really, really cautious and there's tons of effort that goes into making sure only sterile or non-reproducing uh, things are being used. And it, so we're talking, this is why we don't have in place controls because 10, 20 years later, they're still making sure these things aren't a problem. So I think we're past those days of causing more problem, um, but, but you can't get permits to even use this stuff until after a ton of study and making sure that it's safe. But it's a great question. Yep, two up front. Go. Um, I just have to recommend an uh, eminently readable book. It's called The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan. He is a um, reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel that has done amazing research and he takes different areas of how things have changed, what we can do, what we've done, and so I highly recommend reading it. Again, it's The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan, and it is in paperback and online. And it is, it is a great book. We, uh, my staff actually interviewed him when he came to Northern Michigan. He spoke at a local bookstore event at the Kapowski Middle School, and we asked him various questions. Um, it's a, it is a great book. So Gail, I was wondering if you could speak to the actual history of the water quality in the Great Lakes. Is it improving? Is it getting worse? What's happening with it? Okay, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was sort of the history and the trends for water quality in the Great Lakes, if it's getting better or getting worse. Um, both. So what, what we're seeing is that we are addressing effluent that comes out of what they call a point source. So, you know, if it's an industry that's got a pipe, and their, that's their wastewater. We've got all kinds of laws in place limiting what that looks like. So the toxins um, uh, in the Great Lakes are way better shaped than we used to be. We still do have what they call areas of concern from sort of the legacy of old stuff that happened that we're trying to clean up. Um, but in terms of the effluent from a point source, much, much, much better. In terms of the ecological changes, we're not seeing improvements there. And that's from things like invasive species, habitat destruction, wetland filling and draining, non-point source pollution, which is sediments and nutrients that comes off the land, sort of in, you know, it's not sheet form, I mean, it ends up in stormwater, usually in the cities. That's the single largest input into the Great Lakes, and we're not seeing improvements there. So on the toxic level, yes. So are the fish safer now? Yes. 
but on the ecological stance, we still have a long, long, long ways to go. Now there is something called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which um, there's about 300 million a year that comes to the Great Lakes to do restoration activities. We've seen some real improvements at those particular places. Um, you know, you have to correct where those erosion sites are, clean up the stormwater, try to limit the amount of habitat destruction and filling, etc. And we'll start to see improvements, I think, over time from that. Yeah. Uh, we're all reminded every day of today's high water levels, as yes. you mentioned earlier, and uh, maybe worried about what's going to happen in the next few years. I think most of us can also remember 12 or 15 years ago when we were alarmed when it was so low. In your studies uh, and experience, Gail, do you have, uh, is there a, an ebb and flow time period? I mean, over history, is it like every 20 years when it changes? Or? Um, so the question really is, is there a time frame to the cycles of water levels in the Great Lakes? Um, that's a good question. If you look at the um, Army Corps of Engineers website, you've, I'm sure all seen those reports that show the fun little red lines that go up and down over what is considered average. Um, that does seem to go up and down in a sort of cyclical way over a certain period of time. But things have changed dramatically in terms of our ice cover precipitation. And so, you know, from the climate scientists, what they're saying is, we don't know. It looks like we will continue to go up because even though we won't have the ice cover, the Great Lakes region is expected to get more precipitation, more snow and rain. So that'll continue to have the Great Lakes go up. So there are those that say, yes, there is some sort of cycle, but all, all bets are off now because we've got some significant climate changes that have happened already in the Great Lakes. The other piece of that, I have a staff member who said, if you really look back over time, you'll see that there's almost a hundred year cycle. I used to have a friend when I first um, came to the Great Lakes from suburban Detroit say, oh, it's every seven years, every seven years. And I started looking, no, it's not. <laughs> there is nothing that's happened on a seven year cycle. But it does appear that over a hundred years, there truly is a cycle. Um, where we're at in that hundred years is pretty high, but we also have this change, these significant weather changes we're expecting. So the answer is, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've talked about the invasives, uh, obviously the mussels, the mussels, the fungus. We don't hear anything about the lamprey. Is that gone? Is it gone? Attacked or taken away? So sea lamprey used to be, you know, the gruesome, gross thing that latched onto um, Atlantic salmon that were introduced in the Great Lakes. They are still in the Great Lakes, but they are managed with significant amount of resources from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So there's a lamprecide, which is a chemical that kills the lamprey. And there are lamprey weirs, so that most of these um, river systems, say if you take a dam out of a small river in northern Michigan, you better put up a lamprey weir that prevents the lamprey from swimming up into that stream and reproducing. Um, the Boyne, the Jordan rivers, and some of the other rivers, Fish and Wildlife Service goes out, um, shocks everything in the water. Um, the fish, not so much that it kills them, but at least they collect them, all the lampreys out there. They're spending a ton of resources over the last 20, 30 years to get rid of the lamprey. They're still there, but they're way under control. You'll still find them periodically on a Great Lakes fish. You know, those of you who fish a lot in the Great Lakes, every once in a while you'll see a lamprey attached to a lake trout or a salmon um, or a white fish in, in Lake Superior, but nowhere near as many. So that's one of those success stories. You know, there's a difference between eradication and management. They are not eradicated, and good luck eradicating any of these invasives, because how could you? It's a big system. But management, how to keep it in a, in a controlled situation, and sea lamprey, we've been very successful with that. With a lot, millions and millions of dollars. Yep, way in the back. Are the beers an effective tool for the Asian carp? No. Asian carp are jumpers. They love to jump. They'll jump right over. They're, you know, and salmon too. I mean, salmon can get over the weirs. That's how the that's how the lamprey weirs only keep the lamprey out. Is fish can jump. Yes. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, so yeah, the thing with the Asian carp is, of course, there's so many different species, and there's going to be a different management for each and every one of them. We've kept trying to encourage people to, you know, eat them. Is there some way we can have a commercial enterprise to catch and eat? Uh, Asian carp, but they're gross. They really are disgusting. 
And so, you know, they've found that they can turn it into fish food or cat food or whatever. Um, but then there are, you know, there are obstacles obviously because of quantity and there really isn't much of a market. Well, the canal, the electric barrier, things do get through it, um, and so they're beefing that up. They're currently in the process of adding other layers to the electric barrier that's in the Chicago River and the canal that's supposed to keep the car out. Um, they're looking at that. They're also um, looking at other river systems and other canals where they're going to need to add electric barriers. The real issue isn't even, well, it is. The issue certainly is that they're coming up the Chicago River. The secondary issue is they do what they do, which is they get into those little marshes and small ponds, and then we have really high water levels right now, as you all know, and then what happens if those flood and then they, they escape that way, not through those little channels that need electric barriers. So that's a really big concern as well. Someone who hasn't asked a question, I saw a couple other hands that went up. And then um, back in the bit, did you have another question? No, okay. Anything else related to all these fun topics? So thanks, you know, for all you do to care about the waters you vote in. I know that voters are, you are all on the front line. You see when it's changing, um, and you, you obviously care enough to be here to listen to what I have to say about water quality. So look at our website if you have an interest in learning the cards, watershedcouncil.org. So it's pretty easy to find. It's on all these materials. And then if you want more information after, um, you can find me really easily through our website or some of our other, our other staff. And then, of course, Laura can connect back to us, too. All right, thank you so much. Have a great day.